it's an energy thing. It moves around a lot. The process of identification is, I'm right there with you. In the height of the moment, I say assassin because that's what I feel like. I'm locked in, I've got my sights on you, and I'm gonna take you out. Early on, I tapped into that instinct, and that's where I want to go every time. I want that feeling. Because I'm just after that one thing. I'm not after your soul. I'm after your fucking aura. People often ask about, you know, when you nearly died, Mick, do you regret? <sighs> I mean, technically, you know, on a karmic level, I, I kind of regret that I got myself into that state. But the other part of me says, could it have been any different? And every time I ask myself that question, I say no. I don't want to get too mystical about it, but I do believe that everybody has a destiny, but that not everybody grasps that destiny. Mine was pretty clear when I look back, and especially in the fucking name, Mick Rock. Is that your real name? It is Michael David Rock. That was your dad's name? Rock was his name, yeah. It was just good timing, wasn't it, really? Photographer Mick Rock joins us. His photos make up a large part of the David Bowie. I just followed my instincts. I knew what I liked. I was drawn, you know, to the good, the bad, and the wicked. I've lived a very wild life right. because, you know, I've been hanging out with a lot of very wild people. And the camera just kind of led me by the nose almost, and I, I, uh, I never looked back. It just kept going and going and going. Legendary Nick Rock. This is just, I mean, come on. Freddie Mercury and Queens. Uh, uh, uh. And there's Lou Reed, my man. I learned a lot from Lou. Yes, yeah, I learned absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's not all my best habits, I might add. Yeah. <laughs> oh. You haven't even looked at the stills. I mean, it, they do look amazing on the stills. No one's published a decent, or I haven't seen a decent still. Of the show. I've got hundreds of them. Where? Well, I do. I haven't got any here. It's been no, I mean... I haven't seen it. What the fucking thing looks like. Still to this day, you're dying to see it. What does the show look like? It looks amazing. Part of the idea for me to come on the trip is to take stills as well. I always fulfill. Okay. Everything that I've said I do, I've done. I fulfill. Oh, I do actually. Ah. <laughs> I 
always knew that this was the life I was meant to live. I just had to, you know, make sure in the final analysis that it made some kind of sense. Yeah, I came back here in my dreams. I even teleported once or twice in a certain state of psychedelic inebriation. Yeah, this place gets into your skull, no doubt about it. It's a beautiful place. In this environment, you could be in any century, and I think that enabled my imagination to run, shall we say, a little frantically. My mother fueled a certain insecurity in me that the only way I could get an identity was to get into Cambridge. It wasn't easy to do for someone born of extremely modest means. It did teach me something about projection. If you project strongly enough, and I sometimes, in my early days, you think, well, I got there because my mother projected it. That's where I got my head full up with all this, you know, great poets zoomed out of their brains, coming up with great art. The symbolist poets, the English romantics, and, of course, the American beat poets. Arthur Rimbaud was like the ultimate realization of the symbolist poet. He would go like, for several days without food and sleep, and then he'd whack a little bit of chemical inside himself. He worked in a purely associative way. Oh, maintenant. Nous si dignes de ces tortures, rassemblant fervement cette promesse surhumaine, faite à notre corps et à notre âme créée. Cette promesse, cette démence, l'élégance, la science, la violence. The idea, the idea of these people, and the idea of the kind of lives they led, started to confirm my suspicions that indeed there was. There was a more interesting life than the one I'd had as a, uh, as a child. It wasn't a bad life. The lysergic experience opened up my third eye, you might say. I remember the first time I went up to see this guy, he was an artist, and he had a bottle of the liquid stuff with a dropper. And he got out the blotting paper. He couldn't have known how strong but this stuff, I remember. Once it kicked in, the entire universe, like, rushed through my body. I saw everything, everything. It definitely, I mean, intensified all the colors, intensified the fray, I mean, it intensified everything. The altered state was something that was there. I mean, it, it, it had become part of me. The yoga fortified. The practices of Yogi Bhajan enabled access. You know, you could be in a non-chemical state and you could still start to get traces of this perception. And then when you combine the two, of course, whoops the daisy. wandered idly into my life. There was a chemical experience, a chemical overload. Well, I got the excitement of the phew, Every time I pressed that shutter, it was like an explosion. It looked different every time I clicked it. So there was this 
world of um, entertainment in the camera. Three days later, I was back in my friend's room and I saw the camera, because it was his, not mine. And I said to him, oh, I think I, you know, shot some film the other night. I bet that's interesting. <laughs> Apparently, there was nothing in the camera. But still, that's when this word, you know, you can put it in quotes, magic, started to get into my mind. Between the 67, that's the summer of love. And here I am, you know, Fanny Go Lightly. I had a habit of staring at friends' faces under certain circumstances, because you could see the whole of the universe since the beginning of time would revolve and roll. I remember that so vividly. I would take pictures of uh, lady friends or girlfriends of friends, and it wasn't, it wasn't that long when somebody offered me a fiver to take photos of a local band, and my brain went clunk. Hello, hello, hello. In the beginning was Sid, psychedelic Sid, like nothing I'd ever seen before. In fact, like nothing really anyone in England certainly had ever seen before. Had a band called Pink Floyd. But Sid had actually left Pink Floyd and was living in relative obscurity. He asked me to take the cover photo for his solo album, The Madcap Marks. I didn't really have any plans, it was simply to shoot El Cid and Iggy opened the door in the All Together. All Together now, Miss Iggy. She was holding company with Sid. But of course, the gift was the floorboards. He had moved in not long beforehand and he was painting the floorboards and he used to paint over all the. I mean, there were dog ends buried in there. He didn't clean the floors before he slept and painted them. I only had daylight film, and they had to be push processed. That's why they had this kind of painterly look about them, because technically they're fucked. See, that should really have been the cover of Madcap Lars. You see the crust. That's what me and Sid wanted. I saw him like a soft poet, like a Baudelaire or Rimbaud or these characters that I've been studying at Cambridge. Yeah, long before those sessions, I took a fucking acid trip with Sid. Just me and Sid, listen to music, a lot of laughing about. I remember he'd roll around, man. He'd piss his knickers. Sid Barrett on acid. He's such a gentle soul. I was an outsider with this little group of hip characters. And you'd spend all your time with these people. You wouldn't hang out with anybody that wasn't. So that feeling of being outside was also a warm feeling because you were inside this other little cocoon of like-minded people. Very strange how it all turned out, though, you know? Sit in the garden. Sid was out of London, was living in Cambridge, and I was starting to write little bits and pieces for different magazines and it's actually did for Rolling Stone magazine. It 
Sid lost interest. He never did another photo session. He never did another interview. He actually said all he ever wanted to do as a kid was jump around and play the guitar, but he couldn't get there anymore. So it was Mark Bolan of T-Rex who first popped up with the makeup and the vaudevillian clothes. However, something more fascinating was looming. It was also very unlikely the carrot-coloured hairdo and the jumpsuit, the red plastic boots and the mismatched eyeballs. No seasoned betting man would have backed this one. But I knew what I liked, and that was enough to make the first move. And I remember the night I peeked around his dressing room door. I like your name. It can't be real, he told me. There and then, he invited me back to his house, and we stayed up all night and talked about all kinds of things. Uh, well, why'd you dye your hair? Is, is that? I just thought it was right for the 70s. Have you? Red hair, right. and nail varnish. Still wearing nail varnish? varnish. Yeah. yeah, not at the moment. I'm wearing a lovely one at the moment. <laughs> that I wore it last night. There was a certain awareness of being with that level of intelligence in the room. You know, the pictures got elevated. They, they acquired this other quality. I remember taking them up to David's office. His manager said, David says that you see him the way he sees himself. Um, that's that's Starman. Starman was strictly, I wrote it in about 15 minutes. Right. It I just used, happened. I used every cliche phrase I could think of. The right. phrase to do with Starman and, and let right. his children boogie and all that. Shoved Mind it, you. shoved it in three minutes. Even if you've written it, with I all know, that in I mind, know exactly what you're going to say. And it's even true. if you've written it with all that in mind, it doesn't make no. any difference. No. I mean, do you think an artist's motives they don't matter? matter they at don't all? matter at all. No, they don't. Right. I don't think they, they really do. don't. I, don't I mean, not one song or not one artist has changed this world. It was a Friday night, I do believe. Oxford Town Hall. It's his biggest audience to date. People were starting to notice him. The encore was coming, and I ran round. I had been up front, and you can see that from some of the other pictures on the contact sheet. I was just on the side of stage. David hadn't announced to me that he was going to do anything in particular. I don't think he'd do with anybody. Don't fake it, baby. Lay the real thing on me. But what he was planning to do was simply bite Nick's guitar. He said to me, did you get it, did you get it? The timing couldn't have been better, because it was as the closets were opening up and, you know, there was David chomping away on Mick's rod. That was a big deal. In terms of a bigger audience for my personal work, people started asking who took it. I hadn't done a lot of performance photography until David came along. And actually, you look at the early pictures I did of David, and you can see there was a certain looseness that later on, you know, I could get great shapes in the shot. Out in a moonlight we were engaging in a certain amount of propaganda, and I was a true believer. I mean, this moment in time, he did not need bodyguards. It was all designed to give people the idea, well, who's this guy? We don't know who he is, but he's got these bodyguards and a personal photographer. He must be a big deal. He had a mission, which he spelled out to me very early on. 
Ziggy Stardust is an album is all about stardom. I mean, he's had a whiff of it, but he is not a star. When the album is made, the album made him a star. talking to Terry O'Neill about this once. We went to the radio show a few years ago. And he said he never really hung out with the people he photographed. I was kind of like, you know, especially in these early years, but if it, that's how it all grew. I don't think they felt that I was an outsider. I was part of the fabric. I was celebrating, and I think they all knew that. So I was a natural, organic, you know, Joseph Goebbels for the peace and the time. And I came very cheap. It's a God of a small affair To the governor now she had But her mummy is yelling no And her daddy has told her to go But her friend is nowhere to be seen now she walks through her sunken dream To the seat with the clearest view And she's home to the silver screen This must have been shot in 1973. I suppose minimalistic would be an inadequate description. But of course, I was particularly lucky, as I was often, especially in those days, to have this amazing subject. I mean, what is he, you know? <laughs> Whatever it was, he gave off a certain kind of awareness and I fed off it. It's, I was open to it. Who's in the best of the show? Is there life on Mars? I mean, do you think of yourself as an artist? Do you think you're, you're a photographer? Oh, that's, that's a Zen exercise. That's pointing cameras. Mm -hmm. We've known each other since about 1972, oh. which is really staggering if you think about it. You know, since then, speaking to each other. Wales concert, Save the Wales with David. That was the first time I read it. the encore and David had already been playing I'm waiting for my man and white light white heat anyway come the encore up pop Lou. for whatever reason I was near the back I didn't get any close shots of them perhaps I'd gone out for a piss or something I don't know but I remember noticing even though it was David's concert and Lou had come on for the encore David left Lou alone. He did not go to Lou's mic. He treated him with great deference. I always saw them symbolically, the, the light and the dark, that they had a certain symbiosis. New York, the Velvet Underground, decadence, drugs, kinky sex. For my man. This photograph, for whatever reason, reflects that, a cold shiver went up his spine when he hit the stage. He was sporting this huge Gibson guitar. 
and the makeup, the white face and all the darkness around the eyes. He could tell even from this contact sheet that there was something about that. And then I made the print and that's, ah, that was the coup de grace when it fell out of focus in the printing. Bingo, there's the cover. It's a performance image, but a lot of people don't realize that because it's so still, as indeed is the raw power cover. To me, they're a pair, same place, the Americans in the mix. like a fucking iguana. That worked because the way the light and the whole thing, the motherfucker has the stillness of an iguana. Where is the fucker? That one. That one in the raw power cover. Rock and roll nailed every centimeter of it in that one shot. If that ain't rock and roll, then rock and roll was a wank job. I want to be your motherfucking dog. I want to be your dog. Who would sing? I mean, it was a complete revolution, and most people ignored it. The way the audience was, they were sitting, which is, I got back, that's really weird. He walked into the audience, but there was no way he could really jump into the audience. I felt like a big game hunter. I mean, I was so glued, you know, to the viewer. And, and fucking, you just keep at it. I could get a fixation. Developed very early in me, that, you know, fixation thing. The thing that nearly killed me. I saw all those characters. They were always mythological. They're always like shimmerers. Sid Barrett was a shimmer. Bowie, Iggy, Lou. They were almost not human. They're almost like something that come out of the woodlands, you know? Something, they were magical to me. What do you think I represent out of interest? Because a newspaper asked me today and I got a price of it in a paragraph. Tell me. Oh, they asked oh, you represent. what to people. But in you, in, you know, why am I here? I mean, what am I? Why, why am I? <laughs> I mean, you know, oh, you're in this pop business. Exactly what are you putting forward? You know, kind of right. thing. I really didn't know what to say. You know, I mean, it's the business I'm in. You know, I never really thought actually what I'm, you know, going to put down. Then, and I've never really thought, you yeah. know, I'm going to make my mark as a. I just thought, will I be David Bowie, the first David Bowie? That's all. I suppose I have to say that. He wanted it, he was talking about the stardom. But my mother, I'd seen the projecting and somehow it had worked. Mother had projected me to Cambridge, so. These powers of concentration, I mean, who are you? Really, who am I, what, who am I? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But for a while, I'm this Mick Rock character. I was so enamoured, so enamoured of these auras and the way I saw these people. And that was so strong. And then you look at the pictures, you go, for somebody who didn't have a particularly well-developed personality, they are very strong. It was just something about when I got the camera, something else, some other trick happened. You know, it's almost just using me as a conduit.
It was a mixture of all these things. Well, it's Oscar Wilde or Clockwork Orange or Living Theatre or Beethoven or all these, Jack Brown, whatever. This was like the advancing avant-garde, the new Italian. And a little bit of drag thrown in. I mean, you can never beat a bit of drag. It's so many different things, but when they merge them together, it has a certain ring. And it is an interesting, good-looking, you know, clang. When I came across these characters, my own identity was only quite fragile. Yes, I had this little Mick Rock thing, and rock and roll was, you know, pumping. And whatever, I looked the right way <laughs> for the times. You know, spindly and long hair, spindly long hair, tight jeans. I did wear lip gloss, uh, pictures of me with um, rouge on. Yeah, you know, like a boy would in those days, just feminize himself. Bieber's was the place if you were young and pretty and hip. And I was like the in-house photographer. Look at David, look at big girl. Brian Ferry and Amanda Lear. He was rock and roll, but it was smooth. Roxy Music, of course, they were around. The rockers were the most obvious manifestation of the glam sensibility and the people who most readily understood its publicity value. Even more seasoned performers such as Mick Jagger, Elton John and Rod Stewart adapted to the allure of glam. It's a great time to be young and to be in what people saw as the edge of the culture. And I was like a big dog, you know, gnawing away right on that edge. When I was born, a Mick Rock wouldn't have meant anything. I think the name infiltrated into my psyche and, like, tuned it in a certain way. Because it is a bit like, so if you had a, wanted a rock and roll photographer, what would you call him? You'd call him Mick Rock, and he'd probably be about six foot, and he'd probably be English. If that, if you wanted uh, a stereotype, you know? Prints back here, there's prints back there, there's also books, boxes, fuck knows what. I'm not sure if there's any Bowie there or not, there might be. No, it's like, it's, it's never ending. I don't think this went into production. Well, I don't know, it's a bit kitschy. That's the only thing with photographs, they do hang about the plastic things, you know? I've got the main contenders, including Rocky Horror. I am the king of the glam rock photographers. Oh, Marianne, look. Looking very chaste. The buster wouldn't melt in her mouth. Paddy LaBelle. Not the hoople. John Cale. Lizzie, you know. I've seen Lizzie. He told me he killed somebody. Oh, I don't fucking think so, Phil. And now I love these reverse Mohicans. Very original, Peter. I'm not taking you home to meet Mother, though. Not looking like that, you can't. Look what I shot in the summer of 72. It's Jerry Garcia. In fact, it wasn't that I got bored easily, but I was just infinitely curious, you know?
do give a damn who tricks there are. I mean, they had their moment in time, but I can't remember what it was. The Straubs, certain images, whether it be all those characters or Rocky Horror or, or whatever, have a big cachet nowadays. Skin Alley, you know, people, soiree. But I couldn't have survived on, on the money that I was making at that time. I mean, Transformer, I got 100 pounds. And how about this? That's, I know it doesn't look very well, but it is. Highway, yep, look at that. What's that all about, Mick? I don't think I had a fucking clue where I was going, but I was going to be going there anyway, you know? I was heading straight down the line. And you go, well, where the fuck are you going, Mick? I'm going in that direction. And it's moving at a hell of a lick, you know? But, but that Freddy picture, right? I mean... I look at it, he looks like he's on his way to bloody heaven. But well, they approached me, you know, Mick Rock, because he's taking pictures of famous puffs, you know. I mean, they wanted to look the fucking part. Because they got this first album out, and nothing much is happening with it. They wanted the glam rock image. I had a friend who had a collection of old Hollywood stills. And it was the cover shot, but it, it might have been from the same movie, Shanghai Express. He had a little book about Mylena Dietrich's films, and uh, inside was the shot that did inspire. My brain just went <laughs> and I showed it to Freddie and it was, you know, it was an instant sell. Freddie Mercury, you can, as it were, be Marlena Dietrich. Of course, she was a total professional and basically could lie herself. These guys, it's only the second time they'd ever been in a photographic studio and they were in and out of that mirror. They were up and I was up and down this bloody ladder. And you can see from these Polaroids, the development of that shot. I don't know if I was super nervous about it or whatever, man. I did not let go. Freddie was the one I communicated with most, because he, I don't know, he was camp and he was like, he was a visionary. As Roger said about Freddie, I mean, he would, even when he didn't have a pot to piss and he was crashing on your floor, he'd walk in, acting like he was doing you a favor. Oh, he, he was already playing in Colosseums in his mind. We showed it to the band and they said, fine, we'll do it. But we're also going to shoot this white shot. See, look, our um, gatefold would have been and ended up being the middle of it anyway. So these, they were like, hmm, I think maybe the white one. Of course, it would have looked like Santa Claus is coming to town. <laughs> the thing is, photography is just not complicated. I mean, you can make it complicated if you want, but where I'm coming from, it does, certainly doesn't have to be. I do remember early on re reading something by um, Horst. He said he didn't understand modern photographers and, the, and how complicated they made the lighting, because he both basically had one light and he moved it around till he saw what he liked. And I thought, uh, yes, that's about me. You know, I'm white's doing it, I don't give a shit. 
I want the pictures. I don't care about the whys. Yeah, I get to a session, make sure everything's in place, then I fuck off for half an hour. There's a lot of power breathing, which is a Kundalini yoga thing, playing around with mantras, and the brain machine that brings me right down focused, opens me up. It's like a meditation, so your brain gets cleared out so that the impressions can be fresh. It's important for me, this body connection. I can almost take photographs with my stomach, stomach and the eyeball when I'm locked in. They bypass the rest of me. I don't think I've ever done a session without standing on my head beforehand for a bunch of time. Yeah, I've been doing that since um, <laughs> 1970. Ah, let's get that long goodbye. Yeah, ah, assassin, assassin. I mean, the name alone was enough to get me stimulus. Stanislavski, who's this motherfucker? And then you find out he's the grandfather of the, um, you know, the method school of acting. But one thing he talked about was going into a raw space with a bunch of people and building a circle of concentration. So at a certain point, you know, it kind of takes off. It, it takes on its own energy. You're really more of a driver or you're steering rather than directing in that way. You can see the way people's faces change as the muscles relax or they drop down into that, you know. And in that moment, I'm like a, I'm like a thief in the night. Blang, 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 blang. What was it, what did Debbie say once? I have a quote from her and she, said that if Mick Rock were a drag queen, his name is Miss Direction. Oh, look over there, he says, while he sticks a knife in your back over here, or takes your photograph. If you're in front of my camera, you could be the world's most fucking boring person off camera. The minute you're in front of my camera, you are totally fascinating, you know? So that's really where I'm coming from. My instinct is, you know, once I got the bite on it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not letting go. It did get out of control, it's true. There was a certain amount of, what should we say, venal celebration going on. I never felt like a voyeur. I never felt, I was always on the inside looking out. I think I also enjoyed the fact that I'd had such a cerebral education, a classic British education. And the camera brought me into this intuitive world. Cocaine was starting to creep into the culture, but it wasn't what it became, a raging snowstorm that swept out to the provinces. There's certain reprobates. I'm not a fucking paparazzi, but I just happened to be in this place at this moment. 
It's the thing of Mick Jagger and Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood. It was raucous. What more do you want to know? And the cops kept coming, and no one was answering the door. It's the cops, it's the cops. But eventually, you had to let them in. I mean, it's the cops. And they came up to the attic, and then they, whoops a daisy, the lads were having a bit of a jamboree. They've got a lot of great party pictures, I think, but there's something about the David Lou Iggy and the David Lou Mick moments. They both deny they actually kissed, but I know that's a fib, because I saw them. And why not? Boys were being revolutionaries by kissing each other on the lips in public. Revolutionary gesture. I know the little buggers do it all day long nowadays, but back then, it was something, you know. Oh, I kissed a fucking boy on the lips this afternoon. You go, really, I've done that before. Well, I was roaring. I was on a blue tower. And I didn't stop to think about the implications of where I was at or even necessarily of what I was doing. I simply had to live out this, I suppose, fantasy life of being some kind of mad symbolist French poet. David was inviting me to go to Berlin to take pictures, and Lou was inviting me to come to New York. Even though he, David and Berlin were interesting, New York and Lou Reed were irresistible, unfortunately. I like the feel of the city, and it was a bit ugly in places and grungy, and it was nowhere near as pretty as London or Paris, but it didn't matter. Manner. You could feel the edge the minute you walked into New York. You know, you had to be on your toes, and it was a good feeling. It was torrid. <laughs> and torrid, you know, I needed to get it out of my system. What can I say? It just landed in New York. I hadn't slept for a week. I started shooting him that afternoon. He wanted me to work with him on these images for his new stage show. Now it's recording. Ah, oh, OK. See, what did I do wrong? You pushed me forward. These buttons in the wrong order. Have this off. Right. This has to be on off. Right. Then you push the, all of these are off. Now. Oh, I didn't touch that one. Right, that was all right. You obviously did something. Right. Then you just did all this wild and crazy feedback imagery. The problem was, it started out with 60. By the time of about 12 gigs in, it was down to 30. Then we'd have to get to a location, find some more TV sets. It was a bit of a... But it was, you know, it was an original thing. I mean, Lou Reed, man. Just absolutely unique. None of these sessions were designed for any purpose other than for us to have some fun, and then we'll see what we do with them afterwards. And sometimes the record labels would license for a couple of pennies. Sally Can't Dance was based on one of the photographs I took of him at Blake's Hotel, and he'd gone blonde on me. Of course, this session, it looks like a carnival, a um, barker. He's got that hat. I got a friend of mine to retouch it, make it a little bit candy colored. And I did these great pictures of him and Nico, and I've got a few frames later on that I took of him and John together, but never got them all in the room, which, again, for those of us that care, was a special moment. She said to me, he was my little brother in a former life, because, in fact, she was older than Lou. He was almost like a little boy to her. I think he liked the fact that he had his own pet historian, if you like. The best pictures of me taken in that period were also taken by Lou. It happened on New Year's Eve. 
Ah, oh, there's, well, there's a negative one. That's the one that I've used quite a bit. Blake's Hotel, hadn't slept, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning. But the light's very nice at that time of day. So they're quite flattering. But these ones, it's something about as a session. This is, it did look like a bloody insect. It was like the perfect um, rendition of people's idea of Lou Reed. The shiny, the black, the shades. I mean, he looks fantastic. It's a pure image. You know, he was Baudelaire, a great artist, but a degenerate. He fulfilled people's fantasies. He used to get very irritated about it. But I say to him, but Lou, you know, you've kind of propagated this. sugar drops that's when everything all the really crazy shit started to happen and, and I was kind of addicted to 4 a.m. they call that the hour of the wolf and I love that time because you could get up to all kinds of antics then. I was in the exploration business I would check everything out I mean anybody that was up to anything a little bit saucy in New York I was invited, and also the girls, man, Jesus, you know, and if you had a bottle of cocaine, you know, it's like, whatever. But I didn't really want to be sensible. I wanted to taste all the buzz of the whole thing, up to a point. I remember going to a couple of S&M clubs and going, these motherfuckers are too serious for me. You know, I need to get the fuck out of here. What about punk rock, though? Could you get blamed for that? I mean, it's getting to be a real number at the moment, isn't it? In England and in London and oh, New York, too. Shit, it's just... It's just what? It's not punk rock. Well, that may be true. I mean, you literally punk rock. Oh, I yeah. I told people endlessly, I No, I did not do do up stories. Uh, songs on street. You mean you don't spiritually feel akin to so people like the Ramones, stuff like that? Oh. <laughs> but you like that little single they did there? I thought that was quite cute. I want to be your boyfriend. That's a shit. Huh? It's a heap of shit.
I had a, like an instinct fully developed by them for anything that smelt like a big rodent, and this one did. But you know, a healthy, edgy rodent, and they called it punk. I went down to CBGB's in 1974. There were 20 people there. They used to take the CBGB's, but it's got all four original ones, because Tommy was only in the band for the first couple of albums. By the time I shot that album cover, Marky was the drummer. I spent a lot of time around that glam scene, and there's the fucking Ramones. I mean, you know, not the prettiest bunch alive. In fact, they were, at that moment in time, you could probably have called them the ugliest band around. I remember the art director told me they'd already done three sessions and they hated the pictures and they didn't like photographers. And if they didn't like what was going on, they'd leave. And he didn't really have any money. Did I want to do it? And I thought, yeah. But meanwhile, over the water, I tasted it a bit here and there. Remember Johnny Rotten walking around, calling everybody a bunch of fucking hippies. Fuck off, you fucking wankers. He was busy imprinting himself on the underground consciousness by touting his obnoxious vibes. You remember Malcolm? dangling some kinky underwear in front of me. Say, you want some of this, Mick? Come and photograph my band. It wasn't really about the music. It was more punk as subversion, which it definitely was an attitude promulgated in London. Look at his eyeballs. He's very like, what the fuck are you doing here, Mick Rock, you know? I mean, I would wear a bit of makeup in the glam days, but I wasn't going to get my fucking hair cut, chopped short, and have a mohawk. And no, no, I was. I didn't identify with the glammy stuff. I identified. But I mean, just look, a lot of those fucking punks were really fucking ugly. I'm sorry, they were interesting, but you know, I was into prettier stuff. But that was taken into, yeah, about a decade ago. Look, that's pretty. That was a knockoff of one of my earlier images. And there's Debbie. People often ask me about, and I say, well, it doesn't matter which way you twist the banana. I don't care who it is. I mean, look at Debbie Harry. She even photographed in certain ways better than Marilyn, I think. I mean, and it's really some of the pictures, and the, my pictures, and you go, you know, just her glowing, and, you know, and looking like the Marilyn Monroe of rock and roll. Yeah, because the thing with Debbie is, she was like David. You couldn't really take a bad picture of her. This became the cover of Penthouse. Of course, the irony is she's not only wearing a jacket, but also a scarf. It actually sold more than any other issue of the magazine that year. She had fun with the group, so you can see in a lot of the pictures she's mucking about. But obviously, it's less the idea of glamour and more the idea of camaraderie. If it's just Debbie, I can concentrate on that rock and roll Marilyn or Lolita, that's the case here. If you do this type of identifying when you're looking at somebody, some kind of plasma sticks onto the photographs. Talking heads, they were children of the dam. The Dead Boys wanted to give the vibe of the second Rolling Stones album. I did a lot of stuff with Joan Jett. She was Elvis Presley to me. Often with visual things, I mean, to explain it, it doesn't sound like very much, but when you look at it, it somehow works, you know? Why do certain things stick in the mind? I couldn't fucking tell you the answer to that. It's a Jungian thing. It's a truth that reverberates, that kind of defies itself. It's a truth that 
you can describe up to a point, but then you've got to let it go and let it be unto itself. And, and that's and the that's bigger truth. Bigger truth. True, true. And that's what I discovered with pictures. Beyond my words, lay these more uh, profound, profound, like, like profound, profound, more substantial proofs. Let's put it like that, chunkier truths. And whatever they mean, what you want them to mean. And what, what that's a result of, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Quite often after a shoot, it was not like, oh, the session's over, calm the fuck down and go home, mate. No, I'm ready for more. And part of the problem was I was so indulged. I am a glossy photograph. I was a young British photographer, and I had this association. You know, Mick Rock always shot David Bowie, Louis really Dickey Pop. I mean, if I'd shot nobody else, that would have been enough for me to get invited to every, like, orgy or God knows what that was going on in New York. Oh, this would be... This could be the Ritz. There's Wayne Kramer and Steve Bates' lot from the Dead Boys. And Cherry Vanilla. So when did you have the time for all this, Mick? Well, I had never slept. If you don't sleep, you get about a bit. I mean, what was that Ramon song? I would play at like 6 a.m. in the morning in my studio on 32nd Street in Madison. It would be, oh, I want to be sedated. Oh, did I love I want to be sedated? It was, looking back, it was probably a cri de coeur because I needed a lot of sedation. It's a lot of my problem. Sedate the bastard, you know? <laughs> So in love with cocaine. I loved it, of course I did. At one point, I knew 10 dealers in New York. They were the only collectors of uh, my pictures, because, you know, the exchange policy. I mean, I could get an eight for a fucking print, man. High times, uh-oh. That's how I got good at shooting still live. It could take a long time, and it could work out quite expensive, because the material goods consumed, you know, would get out of control. That's in a meat warehouse, look, you can see the meat. So it was an interesting shoot, but heavily chemicalized, I remember that. Even when I did all that cocaine, and speed. I was also doing yoga. Be up for three days, stand on your head for an hour. I mean, wow. Talk about the big fucking bang in the brain. I do remember once not sleeping for seven days. Anyone that cared knew I was, you know, a little existing a bit beyond the pale. Um, in terms of being reliable in any sense, in terms of, you know, being, I'm just being professional. Just wasn't wasn't being professional. I remember doing that Carly Simon shoot, and she was the first person to say it. She said, yeah, Mick takes great pictures, but you can't find him after the session for days. I was in a lot of denial, though. I didn't get all the way to the bottom of this pit, but, I, but I, it would get... I would get flashes of things possibly getting bleaker. Those were, like, very fragmented times I was living. And I did a lot of different things. It was hyperactive in my rampant insecurity. And then there's Motley Crue. It was glam metal. I mean, it wasn't that I was working that much, so they came and found me. Couldn't tell him, oh, Mick Wright has a problem, and it would be an issue. 
just doing what they're doing. The thing is, it didn't matter what sort of state I was in, where I was at, it, it mattered nothing at all. The pictures would always work. So that kind of sat over here. Over here, meanwhile, is the real Mick Rock, and, and he's getting to be a bit of a bloody disaster. <laughs> Had to leave the city, I owed the landlord a lot of so it wasn't so much, but it seemed like a lot of the time. It could be 10 grand. I mean, I don't know. Perhaps people stopped calling me because I was too much of a loon. I had not been getting enough satisfaction out of photography for a while, and I'd started to do some art direction and a bit of collage work related to the art direction. You know, I don't know what I'm going to do when I do it. It just starts to form. I do one or two things, and this suggests something else, and this suggests something else. And then suddenly, whoops a daisy, you've got this uh, thing. I was a high at the time. Yeah, I was high at the time I did all this early work. But I, I do it now without being chemically, you know, altered. When things started going badly, I wouldn't go to David or Lou and ask them for work. I've not exactly been that communicative with them for quite some time, although they both tried, to be honest. I knew I was too fucked up to be able to face them properly, though. I think there was... I always had some fantasy. When I straightened out, then I could see them again. I don't know if I really fell out with him. I think I got very paranoid because I missed his bloody wedding. And I was supposed to be there to take photographs. And I was, oh. I don't know, man. Just, um, I got myself up a back alley, but it was hard to get down, really. It's hard to get out of it. I think when the shit hit the fan, as it were, when it all started to fall apart, I wasn't equipped. The knees were so strong, and almost my pictures were so strong, that that was my identity. All of them had become a little bit of me. did a shoot. Yeah, well, I was actually out on the west side when the west side was still very raw. And it was cold as well. Oh. 
and a this bizarre feeling. I kind of wasn't admitting to myself what it fucking was. And they could see something was going on. My heart started doing the going. Brr, brr, brr. I was too stunned and too in a state of realizing that, you know, somehow this had all been so inevitable that I was sort of beyond being scared. So this was the fucking end game. You're trying to figure out what the end game's gonna be. And it was you on a hospital bed, nearly dead. And I was singing to myself over and over again, in pastures green he leadeth me, the quiet waters by. And I was weeping. My mother always says we're all living on the edge of a precipice, and that always comes to mind, but will not go lightly into that dark night, that's for sure. C'est grâce aux astres non pareils que tout au fond du ciel flamboie que mes yeux consumés ne voient que des souvenirs de soleil. En vain, j'ai voulu de l'espace trouver la fin et le milieu. Sous je ne sais quel œil de feu, je sens mon œil, elle, qui se casse. Et brûlé par l'amour du beau, je n'aurai pas l'honneur sublime de donner mon nom à l'abîme qui me servira du tombeau. The artist doesn't exist. The artist is strictly a figment of the people's imagination. Right. I really believe that. Dylan is, and, and Lennon is, I will be, Jagger is, anybody, Boland, they're all figments. They don't exist, none of them exist. Yes, they're all members exist. We're in the twilight zone, and we're the, we're the original false prophets. We are the ghosts.
Yeah, I don't think too hard about it because I don't really want to go quite back there. I mean, I mean, I acknowledge it, but I don't like, you know, get into it too much because um, that's not something you want to happen again. No fucking way. Three heart attacks followed by quadruple bypass heart surgery, all in my early 40s. So at times in my life, I've, I've certainly felt like a failure, definitely. Woof, beyond being a failure. I was dead broke. I had a serious cocaine habit. I had zero insurance. And there were my saviors, Andrew Lou Goldham, the original Svengali of the Rolling Stones, and Alan Klein, who had been the business manager of the Stones and the Beatles in the late 60s. They paid for everything. I think it's fair to say they in many ways saved my life. I was just a child of my time, so I don't think... I didn't know what I was, to be honest with you, but I was something, you know, something without being full of it, just something and I'm looking for it. It's there somewhere. And, uh, and it was buried deep. And it took me so long and I had to nearly die to get to what this Mick Rock thing is, other than some kind of parody. Ah. Uh, don't even know where to begin. It's like a monster that I've been dragging around. I haven't thought of making a movie about uh, a photographer who was trapped by his images. I mean, look at it. I can't let go of a lot of it. In fact, most of it. And my job is to protect it. I don't know how it all happened. It just, you know, I was just Michael David Rock. Joan Rock's little boy. And then this Mick Rock thing took over. Do you enjoy being a rock star? Fantastic. <laughs> what do you think you are at heart? I'm a rock star. But you live off other people's ideas. I live on everything. I live off the world. Do you think, yeah, I think I make good use of this world. I tell you, I'll take everything it's got deliberately and make it things difficult. But you could have had it. You could have had it things a long time ago. It would have been right. Why now? Why is this happening now? Why is I always right all the time? All right, lads, eyes down for England. Let's get rolling. I'm going to want this back a bit, very high. I want to switch that one off so it doesn't distract me. Switch off the overhead lights. Let's get some drama into the mood. Have a seat, sir. I hate to say it, well, maybe no, I don't know. Head up a bit, I got a dash of Rasputin. Oh, yeah. He's played, he, he does pop up. More than a dash. Yeah, okay. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> now, if you stand up for me against the backdrop, it's going to take a little bit of patience. Move that a little bit. It doesn't have to, like, disappear. But just come right up to here. Bring that light around. 
come right back against this now. You, you want to keep the jacket? I like it. No, but I like it down if you want. I was going to give you one of these. Yeah, yeah, give me one of them. Like, yeah, yeah. Give me four of them. Mm -hmm. I've done this before. <laughs> Listen, I'm not expecting originality. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I fucking, I knew one would shot that I'd start to love. Oh, yeah. Because every so often, I nail one. Ah, 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 right towards me, Josh. Push him right out at me. There, and up a little. Yeah, yeah, whatever you want to do, and that's fine. Yeah, OK, 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 OK. Aha, 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 aha. Whew. Did I get off nearly? <laughs> <laughs> I know I need to do these things for therapeutic reasons. I'm better and healthier when I do them. So there's a lot of different pressures, but really, once I'm in the open field with the creative part is happening, whatever the fuck else is going, that, you know. Yeah, 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 beautiful, beautiful. I love it, I love it, I love it. Yeah, stay, stay with me. There's a certain hunger comes over me when I pick up a camera, and sometimes I joke about, you know, being a bit of a vampire and especially shooting younger people because the blood tastes better. The hands, move the hands around, like very, ro I, I mean, the robot bit. Ah, snoop, man. Ah, this is one for the fucking ages. The only control you have is in the doing of what you're doing. You can't dictate what will have resonance. The thing that used to irritate me is, you know, he, oh, the man who photographed this person or that person, but after a while, you know, it's like being called the man who shot the 70s. It's just a tag, right? But whatever, it is what it is, and it's better that, that you're thought of in some way that is, like, not so awful than not to be thought of at all. Of course, the amazing thing for me nowadays is that this rock and roll photography stuff is in museums and galleries and cultural institutions all over the world, and I keep thinking something went very wrong. We were supposed to be rebels and outsiders, but nowadays we have been absorbed by the modern establishment. Well, I got lucky a lot, didn't I, Lou? I got very lucky at times, let's be honest. When you have that much luck, at a certain point, you have to say, there's more involved. You know, continuously in the right place at the right time with an instrument that continuously takes beautiful pictures. So, granted that that rock has no talent. <laughs> You know, I just think if you have the right obsessive nature, you know, it could be a sick obsessive nature, but it, you have to have the capacity to, um, to be fascinated. And I think you can fascinate me. I'm like, a, you know, a baboon with a banana. And a camera, of course. The mystery of it all. And that's what excites me, is how mysterious so much of this is and how these things happen and why they happen. And the fact that, you know, you can kind of smell this stuff, but you can't 
really describe it. I mean, I love, I love to take pictures. Yeah, crank it up a little bit. Lively it up just a little, a little bit. Yeah. This guy's a right fucking cunt. He's mad as a hatter. I thought, send him over immediately. Come on in, gentlemen. Merci bien. All hands on deck. Fucking Motley Crew. Come for a spanking session with Mick Rock. No laughing, you punk. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the birdie. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on the prize. You can do it too. Helps if you're high, of course. Now, what a fucking feeling. Can I feel it? Ah! Oh, it's a bit too old. What's my name? What's my name, Danny? Final roll. You know what you said working with me was like? Tell him, tell him. You said it. It's like doing crack. It was fucking like doing crack. You smell good. This is all round. Oh. 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 oh, yeah. One more. One more. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You're fabulous.